Hello and welcome to today's video. In this video, we're going to extend our definition of integrals from step functions to a much larger class of functions. The idea here is to approximate any function that we have through a series of step functions that we refine and refine until hopefully that refinement converges. I'll make that precise in a minute. Well, let's uh, first write down the headline. This section is titled the Riemann integral. And let me preface that by telling you that the Riemann integral is just one possibility of defining integration, uh, one of the most basic but still versatile possibilities of defining an integral. There will be functions that are not integrable using this definition of integration, but it, on the other hand, it will be sufficient for almost everything that you will encounter. There is a much better, much more advanced definition of integration on several levels. One possibility would be to use Lebesgue integration, the Lebesgue integral. That is a very different point of view on things that leads to a much larger class of integrable functions. And that, uh, for example, is important um, if you want to dabble in probability theory. Um, there's a lot of functions that need to use an extended version of integration, specifically Lebesgue integration. But on the other hand, it's much more complex, much more complicated to introduce this. So for this lecture, we are going to stick to Riemann integration. And as I said, the idea is basically to approximate arbitrary functions, or at least a large class of arbitrary functions where this process will work through step functions. Now, how exactly is this done? Let's look at a quick sketch to illustrate the idea before we go into the actual definitions. Now, let's say we have a function, for example, that looks like this here on a certain interval. So let's say here and here, these are the start and endpoints of our interval. So these are also going to be the start and endpoints of the subdivision of any step function that we want to approximate this. And let's just use uh, one possible subdivision. Let's say uh, we add a point in here, maybe one here and one further point here. So we have x1, x2, x3 and the last point will then be x4. And now we define two step functions that correspond to the subdivision. The first one will be a step function that is always below the given function. So in each of those intervals we choose the smallest possible point of the function and then define that as the function value of the step function. We could, of course, also use a value that is even lower than that. That does not really make much of a difference. But of course, we want the best possible approximation. So it makes sense to use the best value that we can get that is still below the function. So we like this here. So this is the function value of that step function in this interval. In the next interval, we can choose this value here, still below the function. Here we need to choose this value. And then in this last interval, we want to choose this value here, for example. So we're still below that step function. Um, and then we can approximate the area below that function f by simply computing the integral over that step function. It will be the areas of these rectangles here. And of course we can do the same thing 
by enveloping the actual function from above. So let's define another step function that is always above the original function. To do this, we would choose the function values, for example, like this. Need to go a little higher here. We can go a little lower here. And then in this interval, we'd be like here. And again, using these rectangles, we can approximate the actual area below the function graph of f. Now we can bound it from above. So if we use these rectangles here, and that will give us an upper bound on the area that we actually want. So the red rectangles will provide an upper bound. The green rectangles will provide a lower bound. And of course, the idea now is to just refine that subdivision. So we started out with just four points. Maybe we could do a lot better if we would use like 400 or 4,000 or maybe 4 million. Um, and hopefully, if we are refine that sufficiently, then the lower bound and the upper bound will become closer and closer and hopefully converge to the same value. And if that happens, this value would then be the value of the integral that we are looking for. So the question here is, if those converge, then we could define a meaningful integral. And that's exactly what we are going to do. Now, before we are going to do that, we'll have to define the notion of an infimum and a supremum. The idea is basically that we want something like a minimum and a maximum over a set, but maybe that number is not included in the set. For example, think of an interval like the open interval from one to two, like this. Then this set does not have a minimum because every number in that set, for every number in that set, there is a lower number in that set. So you can always decrease it by a very small amount. And that is because you cannot take the number one as the minimum because that's not included in the set. The minimum always needs to be included in the set. And the same is true for the maximum. Two cannot be the maximum and every number lower than two, there's always a number that is still in the set but higher than this number. So to overcome this problem, we define what we call the infimum and the supremum, which is basically the infimum is a lower bound on the set, um, and more specifically, the largest lower bound possible. So the infimum here would be one. There is no lower bound that can be chosen larger, and that still is a lower bound. And the supremum is an upper bound, and more specifically, the lowest possible upper bound. So that would be two in this case. I write down the definition to make this more precise. And then we'll apply this subsequently to define our Riemann integral. So let's first say we have an arbitrary subset of, of uh, the real number. So it doesn't have to be an interval. That's really arbitrary. So let's set subset of R be a subset of the reals. Then we start with the definition of the infimum. A number B in R is called the infimum of set and is denoted by b equals inf offset if the following hold. So what you want is two conditions. First, b needs to be a lower bound. So b needs to be less or equal to every element of set b is less or equal to set for every set in capital set in the set. 
And the second one is it needs to be the largest such possible bound. So for every other bound with that same property, B is larger or at least as large as that bound. So if B hat is less or equal to set for every setting capital set, then B hat can be at most B. So in other words, B is the largest lower bound on that set. That's the infimum. And the supremum is defined in the same way, just with an upper bound. So in number capital B in R is called supremum offset and denote it as capital B equals sub offset if the following hold and again that's basically the same conditions but with the in, uh, inequality signs reversed so B is greater or equal to set for every element in that set and if B hat is greater or equal to set for every element in capital set then b hat is greater or equal to b. So in other words, b is the smallest upper bound. Okay, so that's what we mean by a, an infimum and a supremum. Um, quick theorem before, you, before we, we see a few quick examples here. Um, if a subset is bounded, then infimum and supremum always exist. So the only possibility that these could not exist is if the subset is not bounded. And of course, that holds for both directions separately. So if a subset said subset of R is bounded below, then the, the infimum of set exists. If set is bounded above, then the supremum of set exists. And as I said, a few quick examples before we apply that to integration to clarify what we mean by supremum and infimum. Uh, let's have a look at the interval from three to five first, five excluded, three included. Then of course the lowest upper bound will be five, whereas the highest lower bound will be three. So the infimum may be included in the set, but it doesn't have to be. So the infimum is three, the supremum is five, and that's not in set, whereas the infimum is contained in set. Yeah. So here set does have a minimum, but it does not have a maximum, but it does have a supremum. Of course, we can easily change those values by adding single points. So as I said, we don't have to have a look at an interval, like we take this interval and then add the number seven. And of course, seven is also included in there. So the upper bound must be at least seven. And that would mean the infimum did not change at all. The infimum is still three, while the supremum of set is now seven. Yeah, so that single number changed the supremum completely. And finally, let's have a look at a set that is defined a little differently. We'll take the numbers one over n, where n in n 
And you can see that that set is bounded and its infimum is in this case zero. For every higher number than zero, there's always a one over n that is that is uh, lower. So that cannot be a lower bound then. But zero is the highest possible lower bound. So that's the infimum. And the supremum here, of course, is one. That's the highest number in that set. So again, one is included in, in that set, zero is not. So now that we've uh, gotten these technicalities out of the way, let's have a look at the definition of the Riemann integral. We can now tackle that. So here's the formal definition. As usual, we'll start with an interval and we'll have that a closed interval, which is not necessary, but we'll keep it that way for, for now. So let i be the interval from a to b, be a subset of r, and an interval. And let f be a function on that interval. And what we want from that function is it, it has to be bounded for now. So let f be a bounded function on i. So for example, if f is continuous, it would have to be bounded because that interval is compact. Well, if we have that, let's first define these two approximations. You remember, in the beginning we sketched that idea with this green approximation from below and the red approximation from above. And we call these approximations Riemann sums. The lower Riemann sum is the approximation from below and the upper Riemann sum will be the approximation from above. And formally we define these using step functions or integrals over step functions in the following way. Now the so-called lower Riemann sum of f over i is defined as the supremum of all integrals over i of a step function s of x dx, where s is a step function over i, with the property that this step function is less or equal to f of x for all x in i. So we take step functions that are less or equal to the original function uh, we integrate them and then we take the supremum over all these integrals over all suitable step functions. That's the lower Riemann sum. And of course, the upper Riemann sum is defined pretty much in the same way. And that is the infimum of s of x dx over i, again, over all step functions. And this time with s of x is at least as large as f of x for all x in i. All right, so we take the upper bound here. And now we say a function is Riemann integrable on i if the lower and the upper Riemann sum are equal. And that value will then be called the Riemann integral over i. So that's part two of that definition. The function f is called Riemann integrable. or in the future, we'll just say integrable over i. If 
it's lower and upper Riemann sum over i are equal. And that value is then called the integral. Or more specifically, the Riemann integral, if you want to stress that. And the notation is pretty much the same as you've already seen. Um, so this is denoted by either the integral of f of x dx over i or with explicit bounds, the integral of f of x dx from a to b. The function f in, in this uh, context is referred to as the integrand and the interval i that is sometimes referred to as the range or the domain of integration. Let's mention that as well. The function f is referred to as the integrand The interval i is sometimes called range or domain of integration. And finally, for convenience, we'll define a few shorthands. So that's the third and last part of that definition. For convenience, we set first the integral from a point to the same point. So over an interval of length zero, that is defined to be zero, which sounds reasonable. And also we define an integral um, over the set from B to A. So we kind of reverse that interval's upper and lower bound. Um, and it makes sense to define this as kind of going over that interval backwards. So that means the interval length will count negatively. Um, and that is defined as the negative integral from A to B over f of x dx. Now, of course, we still don't know how many functions are integrable. Um, we need a bounded function, but not every bounded function may be integrable, and not every bounded function is integrable. And to illustrate that fact, let's have a quick look at an example here. Let's say, we consider a function f defined on the interval from 0 to 1 to r. And let's say that function is defined as 0 if x is rational and 1 if x is irrational. Then you can see in, in every interval, as small as it can be, there are rational and irrational numbers. Both will be in that interval. So that means f takes on the value of 0 and 1 in every interval. So for every interval, i, which is a subset of the domain, f assumes both the value of zero and one on i. And that means the lower Riemann sum, 
always has to be zero for every interval, whereas the upper Riemann sum always has to be one for all interval. So the lower Riemann sum is zero. The upper Riemann sum is one. So these do not converge to the same interval at uh, the same value. They do not agree. And that means F is not Riemann integrable. So not every function is Riemann integrable. Admittedly, that was a little curious function, but there are also examples that are more realistic and appear in actual applications that may not be Riemann integrable. To conclude with positive news, most functions that we actually use are Riemann integrable. And here's a theorem that covers a large class of functions already. So let's say i is a bounded interval. So let i be a subset of r in a bounded interval. So it doesn't go to plus or minus infinity. It can be open, it just has to be bounded. Um, and let f be a function on that interval that is also bounded because that's what we require for the definition of Riemann integration for now. Then if f is either monotone or continuous, or of course both, then it is integrable over i. And there's even a relaxation to that. There can be a number um, of points where f is not continuous or not monotonous. It just has to be finitely many. So if f is monotone or if f is continuous on i up to finitely many points, then f is going to be integrable over i. So most functions that we deal with are continuous or at least are composed of finitely many continuous functions. So there might be these finitely many possible jumps, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and that means a large class of functions is Riemann integrable. And usually the functions that we deal with will be of that type more or less. We have not yet talked about um, functions that are defined on an interval that includes plus or minus infinity. So integration over these intervals is still an open question. And of course, integration of unbounded functions is also still an open question. We talk about these in one of the later videos. But before that, we first have a look at some properties of the integral um, and also at a few applications of Riemann integration. And as usual, I hope I'll see you then.